One of the things that I try to avoid as much as possible is decision fatigue with small decisions. That's why you see me wearing the same t-shirts in pretty much every video and Instagram photo. And if you're looking to reduce your decision fatigue when it comes to points and miles, this video is for you. We'll walk you through some quick rules of thumb for when it makes sense to buy points, how to pick your next card, and how to check if a limited time promotion makes sense for you and you're not just jumping on it out of FOMO. Also, make sure you stay until the end because I'm gonna walk you through my personal rules of thumb for how I decide which people and services to invest in for GeoBreeze travel. Okay, let's jump right in with how to decide if you should buy points if they're on sale. Okay, this first example is going to be for a sale for Air France points. And this sale may or may not be active by the time you actually view this video because it's expiring at the end of February, but it's a good illustration of when it's a good idea to buy points and when it's not. So this particular sale, you can get a 50% discount on purchasing points. So that means if you wanted to purchase 16,000 points, it's only $300. 80,000 points, $1,200, 100,000 points, $1,500. And so you might ask yourself, okay, is that a good deal? Should I spend $1,500 on 100,000 Air France points? Maybe. There are two rules to keep in mind here. One, only purchase points if you already know how you're going to use them and you can turn those points around pretty quickly. And then number two, you wanna make sure that the purchase price of the points is less than the purchase price of the ticket if you were to just outright buy the flight. So for this Air France example, let's say that we went to Seats.Aero and we are based in Denver. And we like this flight from Denver over to Paris for 50,000 points at the end of March. And then when we look on the Air France site, we do in fact see that this flight from Denver to Paris on March 31st is available for 50,000 miles. Now, let's say we also just don't have 50,000 points in Chase or Amex or Capital One, City, Built, or any of those other programs that would transfer over to Air France, and you wanna get this booked right away, so you're like, mm, maybe I should purchase points. If you were to purchase 50,000 miles on this Air France sale, that would cost you $762. Regular price would be about 1,500. Is that a good deal to purchase this business class flight? for about $762. Probably yes, but we do wanna compare how much this ticket just costs if you were to outright buy it with money. So to do that, I usually just go to Google Flights and then I search for this particular route from Denver over to Paris on March 31st. Here's this Air France flight. It leaves at 5.45 p.m., so it's the same flight. The cash price of this ticket is $4,300, close to $4,400. And so instead of paying $4,400 for this, even if you don't have any credit card points right now and you have no high rewards earning credit cards, you could just go in and buy points, spend $762, buy the 50,000 miles, deposit them into your Air France account, and then you save about $3,600 that way by just purchasing the points and redeeming those rather than outright purchasing the ticket. And again, you don't need any special credit cards or anything to do this, but let's say that you really wanted to take this flight down here where it's almost 250,000 miles, 246,500 miles. They won't even sell you that many points at a time on Air France, but let's say that they did and it was just 2.46 times the price for 100,000 miles. That would come out to $3,751. Now that is still slightly cheaper than just doing the cash price, which is still about $4,300 for that particular flight. But in that case, it is still a better deal to just purchase the points. So that is the logic here where you would wanna find a good points deal, see how much it costs to purchase the points, and then compare that to how much it costs to just purchase the flight outright. Because instead of paying $4,400, you can get this flight for 50,000 miles, which you can purchase for about $762. Here's another example of when it might make sense to buy points. So the Palazzo Resort in Las Vegas is bookable with IHG points. Normally the cash price would be $559 per night, but on this night on June 20th with points, it's only 28,000 points. So our choice is would it make more sense to buy 28,000 points or to pay $559 
assuming we don't currently have any IHG points. Well, at the time of recording, IHG has a sale on points. And so to purchase 28,000 points, that's about 15,000 plus 13,000 right here, it would be $172.50 to purchase 28,000 points. And $172 sounds a lot better than 559. So it would be a good deal to purchase points to then use for the Palazzo. But let's compare that to the Venetian. This is also $559 per night. But then with points, it is 116,000 points, which is going to cost a lot more to purchase those points. Let's see how much. So let's say we purchase this level, which is 62,000 points plus 55,800. That would come out to a total of 117,800 points, which is enough to book that Venetian and it would be a purchase price of $620 for those points. As we can see, if it's gonna cost $620 to purchase the points, or it's just gonna cost $559 to book the hotel, you're better off just booking the hotel and avoiding purchasing points, redeeming points, all of that, because you'll save money just by booking the hotel outright. So those are a couple of examples when it would make more sense to purchase points, because by investing and purchasing the points, you actually save money, on the hotel room because you don't have to buy a more expensive cash ticket. You instead just buy the points and effectively get a discount on the hotel room or flight. Are you enjoying these types of videos? If yes, please let me know. Click that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe to the channel for even more points and miles tips every week. Also, if you love free resources that let you maximize your points and give you a clear path to luxury travel, check out geobreezetravel.com slash quiz. There, you'll find a free short quiz that will point you to the best resources depending on whether you're trying to earn more points, redeem your points, or something else. And by taking the free quiz, you'll also get access to the free Points 101 course, which is a fantastic resource for anyone just getting started with points and miles. Okay, next up is how I walk through deciding what card to get next if you only have enough expenses to meet one minimum spend requirement. All right, let's talk through how to calculate the return on investment on annual fees for different credit cards and how to use that to decide whether you should keep the card open or close or downgrade a card. So oftentimes a lot of the hotel cards will cost around $100 per year, like for example, the World of Hyatt credit card, but then it's gonna come with an annual free night certificate subject to different limitations with the hotel. Like for Hyatt, you can use it for a free category one through four certificate. As long as you're actually going to use that certificate and the hotel that you choose with Hyatt is going to cost more than $95, which is pretty much every hotel these days, then the annual fee is worth it. You can keep the card year over year, pay your $95, get your free hotel night that's worth more than $95. Your return on investment is greater than one at that point, so you should keep the card. If however you find that you're not using your free night certificates or you're letting a lot of your benefits expire and you're like, oh, I forgot to use that certificate again, maybe go ahead and close down a couple cards because it's become more than you can really juggle at this point. And if you're having to bend over backwards to use certain benefits or you're just letting them expire, it's not worth paying the annual fee. So that's a really simple example with the Hyatt card. Now let's say you have something with a higher annual fee like the Venture X card. This one has a $395 annual fee. It does have some different perks that you can use to offset that. For example, you have a $300 credit that you can use through the Capital One portal. I tend to just book boutique hotels through there with the $300 credit. And then you also get 10,000 anniversary points every year, which you can use for well more than $100 worth of travel once you transfer it to different travel partners. And then you also get lounge access. So as long as you're able to use that $300 credit and you're able to eventually use those 10,000 points per year, which if you're getting into Capital One points, you definitely should be able to do that. As long as those two things hold true, then the Venture X card is good to keep year over year because the benefits that you're getting with just the portal credit plus the anniversary points already offsets the annual fee, not even taking into account TSA pre-check credits or lounge access or anything else like that. If, however, you're like, I don't like any of these hotels in the Capital One portal, I can never use this $300 credit, it's kind of a pain. Maybe not worth paying almost $400 for this credit card. Now, 
The math gets a lot more complicated as you're juggling different cards that often have overlapping benefits. Like for example, the Amex Business Platinum card has lounge access as well, a little bit different where it's got some Centurion Lounge, but also a lot of the same priority pass lounge as the Capital One Venture X card. You also get the $100 TSA pre-check or global entry credit with each card. Now you can gift those to different family members or friends. You don't have to just use them for you, but let's say you're listening to this podcast and you're like, I don't have friends. I don't have anybody to gift that to, it's just me. Well, then your $100 TSA pre-check credit is kind of going to waste on one of the cards. Similarly with the lounge access, if you're like, well, I'm not near anywhere with a Centurion lounge, I have priority pass already through one of the cards, do I really need them on the second one? Eh, you shouldn't really count those as a benefit when you're doing all of those cost benefit analyses. If it's showing up on multiple cards, you can really only count that towards one card. And then if you're looking through the benefits of the Amex Business Platinum and you're like, wow, that's nearly $700 of annual fees, that's $695, what do I get for that? Well. You get a $400 Dell Technologies credit, so you're like, okay, I guess I can use $400 worth of stuff every year from Dell. And then there's a $360 Indeed credit, but if you're like, eh, I don't need to hire anybody, that's gonna go to waste, I won't really use that. $150 Adobe credit, I've personally never used that. $120 wireless telephone service credit, some people might be able to use that. I personally use Google Fi for our phone service, which unfortunately does not count for one of their wireless telephone service credit partners. So I'm not able to use that either. I do use the $200 airline fee credit and we do use the $189 clear credit. So between that, let's round up to 200 here, 200, it's 400 and 400 Dell Technologies. So it's roughly justified with getting the $700 annual fee if I'm able to use all of those different credits and it's not overlapping with something else like a personal platinum or something like that. But if you were like, eh, I already have clear credit through a personal platinum and I don't really need any more Dell stuff, I'm not able to use any of these different benefits and it's not worth the $695 annual fee, then you don't need to carry that card year over year. You can downgrade it to an Amex Business Gold or Business Green or something else lower so that you don't have to keep paying those annual fees. And that's how I would think about the return on investment of paying for annual fees versus what you get out of the cards. It's definitely worth it sometimes to pay those fees. A lot of people I think are like, oh, I never want to pay a fee. I always want just the lowest fee card. Instead of optimizing for lowest cost, if you're going to be playing this game of credit card points, I would instead say, look into what is your budget for how much you can invest into this game and then try to get the most that you can out of that investment. That's how you are going to calculate ROI, which is return on investment, which I highly recommend optimizing for ROI instead of just lowest cost. Here's how I would think through the math on when you're trying to decide between two different credit card offers and what to get next, and if there's a limited time promotion, should you jump on that or stick to the plan? So here's an offer that recently came about, which is with the Southwest Personal Cards, there is a limited time offer where you can earn Companion Pass all the way through the end of February 2025, plus 30,000 points with Southwest. Now, that's a pretty good offer if you are going to be able to use it, and if you actually have plans to fly with Southwest. The minimum spend on this is $4,000 in order to get this offer. Before you decide, should I get this card or not, you have to think about as opposed to what. Let's say that you have a large $4,000 expense coming up and you're like, I don't know if I should get the Southwest card. I was kind of thinking about getting the Capital One Venture card, which gets 2X everywhere. This one has a $95 annual fee. 75,000 points as a sign up bonus, that sounds pretty good. But then the Southwest Rapid Rewards Premier credit card has a $99 annual fee, so it's about the same on the annual fee. How do I decide which one to get? I only have $4,000 of expenses, so I can only choose one card. Here's how I would think about this. Let's look at the Venture Rewards card first. You're going to get a 75,000 point sign up bonus, and you also earn two points per dollar everywhere. So by meeting the sign-up bonus, you'll also get another 8,000 points, which means between the 75,000 point sign-up bonus and 8,000 points that you would earn for meeting the minimum spend, you'll get 83,000 points in total. 
Now, how much is that worth to you? It depends on how good you are at redeeming your points. If you're like beginner beginner and you don't want to use any transfer partners and you're like, I'm just going to cash them out for Airbnbs in the Capital One portal, 83,000 points is going to be worth about $830. If you have just started dabbling with transfer partners, I would say the Capital One points, you can get at least two cents per point pretty easily. If you're redeeming 83,000 points for two cents per point, 83,000 times 0.02 is $1,660. Personally for us, whenever we are helping clients redeem their points, we usually average about six cents per point. Sometimes we get four or five, sometimes we get 10. But let's say we're getting six cents per point out of Capital One points. Then 83,000 points times 0.06 would come out to about $5,000 worth of travel if you redeem all of that optimally with six cents per point. Technically it's 4,980. So then you say, okay, that's not bad. If I am getting a Capital One Venture card, putting $4,000 on it, getting 83,000 points, I can get somewhere between $1,600 and $5,000 of travel out of that. Should I do that? Or should I get the Southwest Rapid Rewards Premier card? Well, with this one, you get 30,000 points with Southwest. And usually when you're redeeming points with Southwest, there's no really good or really bad redemptions. Everything's almost always just gonna be 1.3 cents per point. So the 30,000 points is gonna come out to $390. And then also, it depends on how often you are flying with Southwest. Because with Companion Pass, whenever you get a points ticket or cash ticket for yourself, your companion can come along for free for just the cost of taxes and fees. So then you have to think to yourself, okay, how much am I spending on Southwest flights in the next year where a companion would be coming with me? If you are spending more than $5,000 per year on Southwest flights, that means that when your companion comes with you, you're saving $5,000 because you don't have to spend for their ticket. If that is the case, definitely get the Southwest card instead of the Capital One card for now. If you're like, well, we're only taking one trip, it's pretty close by, the round trip tickets are less than $1,000, then I would go with the Capital One points because you're gonna get a lot more value out of these 83,000 points that we went over instead of Companion Pass for Southwest. So this one highly depends on how much you'll actually use Companion Pass, but that's how I would think about the cost benefit analysis and the math of if I only have $4,000 to spend and I can only get one credit card, which one should I do? All else being equal with annual fees and everything else. Obviously the math gets a little bit more complicated if you're like, well, what if I get the Southwest priority credit card? It's got $149 annual fee, but we also get the $75 credit and 25% back on savings, anniversary bonuses. The math can get pretty complicated at that point, but I just wanted to show this as a quick illustration of do some quick math to see how much benefit you would get out of a particular card, compare it to how much benefit you would get out of card option number two, and then just go with whichever one mathematically shows that you would get more benefit out of it based off of your particular travel style. Another quick way to figure out what card to get next is just to ask. We offer free credit card consultations at geobreezetravel.com slash consultations. We'll send you personalized recommendations based on your particular goals, budget, and lifestyle. Or if you already know what card you want to get next and you'd like to support this show when you apply for your next card, we have all of our affiliate links listed on geobreezetravel.com slash cards. And you can also find that link in the description box. Another nice thing about some cards is that they can come with status at different airlines or hotels. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of content on Instagram and YouTube about getting free breakfast or upgrades or something like that due to having status. But those perks don't come for free. Is it really worth it for you to jump through all the hoops to get status and get those extra perks? Maybe, maybe not. This next tutorial walks you through how to decide. Okay, let's talk about the return on investment or the ROI of chasing status. So for this example, we're gonna use Marriott because there's currently a really good promotion where for every night you stay, you can earn a thousand bonus points plus one bonus elite night credit every night that you stay. And this is active from February 13 through April 29 and you can register through April 15. So to reach platinum status with Marriott, which is kind of the sweet spot most people go for because that's where you get free breakfast, 
you're going to need at least 50 Marriott Knights credited to your account. To reach titanium status, you will need at least 75. Now, let's say that you don't have any Marriott credit cards right now and you're just trying to get status with Marriott. And you're like, well, I have some Marriott stays planned out, but not 50 nights or not 75 nights. How do I know if it is going to be worth it to just pay for some cheap Marriott nights and then to get status? Like, how do I decide is that cost worth the benefit? Here is how I would go about doing that kind of analysis. So you're going to need to know a few different assumptions. So if you did want to mattress run somewhere near your house where there's just a cheap Marriott down the street, a courtyard Marriott or a four points or something like that, approximately how much does it cost per night? So in this example, we're going to say it's $200 per night to just stay at the Marriott across the street where you can check in, get your double nights, and then not really do anything at the hotel. You want to check at different levels. Is it worth it to do that if you have to buy five extra nights because you are projected to hit, let's say, 45 nights with Marriott? But if you have to buy 10 extra nights, 15 extra nights, 20 extra nights, is it worth paying $1,000, $2,000, $4,000 to hit platinum status? Maybe. Depends on how much you'll use platinum status. Same with titanium. Is it worth paying thousands of dollars if you're just a little bit short with status? in order to obtain that status. It depends. So let's say you wanted to go for platinum status. How much are you actually going to use these benefits after you get the status? So let's say that you're only going to stay 10 more nights with Marriott in the time period where you'll have the platinum status before you lose it. What are you going to get out of having that status? You could get breakfast for a couple people, you could get room upgrades and welcome gifts. Marriott has a great list of different platinum benefits like 50% more points, welcome gifts, enhanced room upgrades. So what I would do is come up with a dollar value that you would stick on each of these different benefits that you're actually going to use. So for the 10 nights where you would stay with Marriott after you get this status, which hotels are those going to be at and how much is breakfast going to be at those hotels? If you're like, I really, really need free breakfast, Okay, maybe it's worth it to get status to get the free breakfast, or maybe you should just pay $40 for breakfast and not pay $4,000 for big Marriott nights. So what you'll wanna do is make sure that you have kind of laid out in a simple spreadsheet, how much is this gonna cost me from additional nights at Marriott that I was not planning to do anyway, and then what am I gonna get out of that? So look through all of the different benefits that you get and try to come up with a dollar value for these. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can see for the room upgrades, I said, for platinum, maybe you're getting an extra $200 of value per night for the room upgrade where maybe you get upgraded from a $300 room to a $500 room or so each time. With titanium, you get slightly better upgrades, so you're getting a $300 upgrade each time. Keeping in mind, you do not get upgraded 100% of the time. So this $200 upgrade value per night with platinum could mean that you're getting upgraded half the time and the value of the upgrade is $400. All of these are just like, assumptions that are for you to plug in and I do not have a data set of like, well, what's the likelihood that I'm going to get upgraded with Marriott? It totally depends on where you are staying, what Marriott it is, when you are staying, how full is that hotel? Is it full of other titanium people? All of that is way too complicated to model on a simple spreadsheet. What you want to do for yourself is to just get some really high numbers of how much extra am I going to have to pay to do this mattress run and what am I going to get out of it? So this is a really simple example that fits on one screen where here we'll say the extra benefits that we would get for being platinum with these assumptions. If you're staying an extra 10 nights, you get about $2,700 of benefits. So if you had to mattress run at a $200 hotel and you only had to buy five or 10 extra nights, which would then turn into 10 or 20 elite nights, yeah, totally worth it. Do you have to buy 15 or 20 nights? Probably not. Just at that point, if you're spending a lot more mattress running than you would on the actual benefits, just pay for the nicer room. Just pay for breakfast. If you're only taking one vacation per year anyway, it is not worth it for you to do all of these status chasing games unless you are frequently traveling. If you guys take one big family trip per year, just save extra so that you can afford the larger room rather than spending $4,000 on fake Marriott nights in hopes of getting upgraded to the nicer room later. That math just doesn't make sense to spend $4,000 when you could instead save those $4,000 and then just buy 
$4,000 worth of nicer rooms and breakfast for your actual vacation. Put together a simple spreadsheet like this for yourself. Let me know if you guys want me to make a template like this. Like I mentioned, there's so many different variables based off of where you're staying, how many Marriott's you're staying at, like, are you able to mattress run somewhere like Mexico where you can probably get hotel nights for 30 or $50 or something like that? Or are you going to be somewhere where you have to pay $200 per night to do a mattress run? So it depends on a lot of different things, but this is just kind of the one, two, three steps that I would do to figure out if mattress running any nights are worth it. Step one, figure out how much extra you have to spend. That's travel you didn't really have planned just to meet your status. Step two, Prescribe a dollar value to the benefits you think you'll get from having that status and incorporate how many nights you think you'll actually use that status in the next year when you do have platinum or titanium, and then compare those two numbers. If you're getting way more benefits because you only have to mattress run five nights or so, yeah, totally do it. If you end up spending thousands of dollars more to chase a status that you'll never actually get to reap the benefits out of, don't chase status. That's how I would do that ROI. By doing a quick cost benefit analysis like this, it can help you make a ton of decisions faster. And don't worry about getting the math exactly correct. Most of the time, not wasting days or weeks making the decision is going to be worth way more than whatever the difference between choice A and choice B is in the first place. And if you're interested in more of this type of content where we go over how to analyze, is option A better than option B? I am doing a free live training for one week only. You can sign up at geobreezetravel.com slash webinar to come join us. For me, the quick cost benefit analysis I do when faced with the decision to invest in different things with GeoBreeze Travel is a 10X rule. And that is, I ask myself, do I have reasonable confidence that if I pay for this information and do what it says to do, I'm gonna get a 10X return on investment on it in less than a year, for example. If it's a $2,000 course, do I think I'm gonna make at least $20,000 out of implementing the content? If yes, then I buy the thing. And if you're like, that sounds like a crazy estimate, who gets $20,000 out of a $2,000 course? You'd be surprised. Usually my ROI or my return on investment is a lot higher than that. In the beginning, I paid about $2,000 for a how to start your business course, and I think I made 60,000 in revenue that first year while still working full-time as an actuary. And then I bought a how to launch a course course. And I think that was about $2,000. And I think I sold about $80,000 in courses with my first launch. And before you ask, no, the courses don't actually have any magic wisdom in them. Usually it's just a clear roadmap with some clear directions on what to do. And the key is to actually just go do those things. Most course content for any course I've taken, that content can be found on the internet. I just personally prefer to go ahead and pay them the $2,000 get my $20,000 in return on investment, and then move on to the next thing. And I'm sure you have a lot of questions on that, so just let me know in the comments what are your questions, and I'm happy to answer them. And I know that some of you are like, but why would I pay for stuff if I can just do it myself? Yes, that's, that's totally a thing in most any industry. If that's you when it comes to points, that's why I make these step-by-step -step YouTube tutorials is for my DIY points people, I appreciate you. However, if you're a busy business owner or individual who spends $100,000 a year or more on expenses and you would prefer not to watch hours and hours of tutorials of my lovely face in order to optimize redeeming points for your next trip, I can appreciate that too. And that is why we offer a one-on-one -on -one points portfolio management service. If that sounds like something that you would be interested in, book a free intro chat with us at geobreezetravel.com slash intro call to learn more. I know this video got kind of long, so let me know if you would like another video with more rules of thumb for how to make informed decisions faster when it comes to points and miles or business or anything else. Suggestions for any other future topics are always welcome too, so let me know in the comments if you have any of those. But in the meantime, if you enjoyed these tutorials, I think you will enjoy this video next.